Well, good morning. morning. And grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, welcome to this time of worship. It is so good to be here with each and every single one of you as we come together to give thanks and praise to our God. Before we get started, I think we just need to take a moment, one more time, to thank our choir for last week. Was that not incredible? Thank you all. It definitely was good. I was was absolutely blown away, and that was so so meaningful to be able to just be here and to have y'all lead us in worship in that way. So thank you all so much. Um, Of course, uh, this evening we're going to have a little shindig at the parsonage that we like to call the PPP, party parsonage with the pastor. That's from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock. We're um, been getting things ready, and we're excited to, to get to spend time with you. My family and I are, are um, just looking forward to, to having a little bit of, of time uh, outside of the walls of the church so that we can just be in community together. So please want you all to know that you all are welcome to come and drop by whenever you would like. Uh, we have, um, my wife has made a chicken chili. We have another um, beef chili, and then I discovered this restaurant. It's a local restaurant. Have y'all ever heard of the place called the Big Tuna? Yeah? Okay. All right. So I did discover this, though. Their gumbo is incredible. And we're going to have a big pot of their, their gumbo as well with some grits, uh, uh, with, with some other stuff as well. So come, bring your appetites, and let's just enjoy uh, being with one another this afternoon. I want to let you all know that our service on Christmas Eve will be at 5 p.m. That is uh, a service of carols and communion. So look forward to being with you guys this Friday evening as we uh, come together to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then lastly, uh, Miss Bonnie just asked that I let you know that the 2022 Um, envelopes, the tithing envelopes have come in and she's placed them in the hallway. So if you'd like to pick up your envelopes, they're out there on the table. So with all that, friends, let us now direct our hearts and mind towards God as we enter into this time of worship together today. Our call to worship is Emmanuel 204, followed by opening hymn. 211, O come, O come, man, well, to stand and join the choir.
Won't you join me for our opening prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, you sent your servant John to make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. Who are we to witness the coming of the Lord? Who are we to receive this great gift? O Lord, give a new shape to our hearts, our habits, and our homes, so that we might be a people made ready for the coming of the Lord. In the name of the one who is to come, we pray. Amen. invite the Harmons to come forward for the lighting of our Advent candle. reading today is Isaiah 7, 10 to 14. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as show or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, or I'll not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and she'll bear a son, and she'll name him Emmanuel. The Lord our God is is with us at all times and in all places. His love is shown to us in this way. God is ever-present and active. We light the fourth of our Advent candles this morning in joyous response to the free gift of God's love for all people. Okay. At this time, I'm Miss Sarah Stuckey's coming forward. We have a special treat for you all today as our children's choir has something prepared. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Miss Sarah. Yes, yeah, so if my Wednesday night kiddos can come on down, um, and we have three songs we've prepared uh, for you. They've been practicing so hard for the last few weeks. So we have The Little Drummer Boy, uh, Silent Night, and We Wish You a Merry Christmas. If you are interested in being in this, um, this program, we start back in February on Wednesday nights. So look out for more information.
If that doesn't brighten your spirits, then I don't know what will. Like Miss Melanie, come lead us in our Psalter for the day. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Our Psalter this morning is found on page 807, where we'll we be singing the first response, and we will only be reading verses 1 through 4. Please stand. Our first lesson comes from 2 Timothy. We'll be reading verses 8 through 10 from the first chapter, where Paul writes, Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God would like to share with you uh, that Mr. Warren Share has been in the hospital for the last week and a couple of days ago they took him up to Waccamaw um, where he is still in the hospital. They've been running some tests. There are some indications that maybe somewhere along the way he has had a stroke. So I would ask that you continue to remember uh, him in your prayers. Um, they do want you to know that they appreciate the cards and the prayers and the calls and the texts that they have been receiving. Are there any other prayer concerns that any of you would like to lift up before we have a time of prayer together? Thank you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we enter into this time together today with not just an urgency, but a deep desire to sing of your steadfast love. We come to this place knowing that we have the opportunity to lift our voices as one voice as we proclaim your faithfulness to all generations and to us. For we, according to your grace, have been blessed to receive your love, a love that we know to be true and steadfast. 
So most gracious God, as we come on this fourth Sunday in the season of Advent, as we continue to prepare our hearts for the celebration of Christmas, we ask, O God, that you would continue to guide us by your Holy Spirit so that we would be made ready to receive the gift of your Son and the fullness of your love revealed unto us through him. But in receiving this precious gift, O oh God, we pray that we would not just hold it within ourselves, but rather that your grace would transform us from within. That it would change our very being, our very makeup. so that we would be inspired to go out into this world, a world of darkness, and to carry this light that shines before us. A light that doesn't just overcome the darkness, but one that brings warmth where there is coldness. That through our witness and our testimonies, others may come to know of the abundance of love that you have for all people. And in so doing, may we bring you glory. Lord, we give you thanks that we are able to lift names up before you today, and we trust that you have heard our prayers. Those that we have spoken and those that we have held within our hearts, and even those that we have failed to mention. Lord, we ask your favor, your blessing upon us all. For we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Now let us continue in the spirit of worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
Most gracious God, we do give you all honor, glory, and praise. Amen.
Friends, won't you stand and join me in the reading of the Gospel? We stand in honor of the reading of the Gospel. We'll be reading from Luke, the third chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Now John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? No, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? And in reply, John said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Now even the tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And John said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we? What should we do? And John said to these, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Okay, so we have been in the midst of a sermon series called A People Prepared. And uh, I kind of want to get us caught up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. And for those of you who haven't been able to be with us um, a couple of weeks ago, this might be helpful to kind of catch you up to where we are at this point as well. For this season of Advent, we're actually looking at the ministry of John the Baptist. And while that might seem like an unlikely uh, theme for an Advent season, there is a reason why we've gone to the ministry of John. We learned early on that John would have a role within God's story of salvation that John would be the one who would go out before the Messiah, that he would be the one who would turn the people back to God, but above all, he would be the one who would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That would be John's role. And so we've given a little bit more attention to the significance of that role. For he would be the one to prepare a way for the coming of the Lord, and he would do that by readying a people to receive the Christ. And so, of course, as we've been looking at this, we've been asking ourselves the same question then. How does this message that he taught then still apply to us today? After all, we are readying ourselves to receive the Christ child on Christmas Day. What should we be doing now so that we are prepared to be a people made ready? And we began a couple of weeks ago by giving attention to this concept of repentance. The observation that we made is that repentance is not a calculated decision. Rather, it is a change of the heart, a transformation of the heart. Our hearts, this is where we started, our hearts must be made ready if we hope to be, to be a people who are able to receive the coming of the Lord. And this morning we're going to continue on that line of thought, but now we're going to give our attention to something else. We're going to look at our habits. How does our habits factor into this as well? And what is John's instructions for his audience still have to say to us about our habits? And more so to the point, what is the relationship between our heart and our habits. What is the relationship between those two? My mother, um, y- y- y'all have met her, many of y'all have met her. Uh, today's her birthday, by the way. She's 70 years old today. So if you're watching, Mom, happy birthday. I love you. Um, I will never forget this 
one time, I think I was in ninth grade, my sister would have been a senior in high school. And my mother and my sister have a very good relationship, uh, very much a mother-daughter relationship, but they're also very good friends. So they're able to talk to one another about serious stuff. And that's been the case ever since my sister was young. And I remember one day I was sitting in my room getting myself ready to go out with some friends when I overheard a conversation that they were having in the kitchen. And there was a reason that I overheard what they were saying to one another because they were speaking at a particular level where it was able to be heard from another room, if you get what I'm saying. I'm I'm not going to go any further than that. But I realized it was one of those moments where I needed to be kind of stealth-like and just stay away from the kitchen area. But my friends were coming to pick me up, and so I left my room, and I walked through the dining area, and I was making my way to the front door when my mother saw me out of the corner of her eye, and she said, and what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I'm going out with my friends. They're on their way to pick me up. And she said, I don't know anything about this. And I apparently replied. I don't know what the reply was, but I remember her response to my reply. She said, no, you're not. You're grounded. (laughs) And I said, what? And she said, no, no, no. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. Y'all got that before, right? I got that all the time. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. And I left it alone that my sister and her were in the midst of a heated discussion that I was just walking by. But nonetheless, I made my way back to my room where I remained grounded for the night. Here's the thing that I'll realize about that day and that I will always take with me is my mother did not have an issue with the words that I was speaking. And to be honest, she really didn't even have an issue with the attitude that I was showing. The issue that my mother had was with the condition of my heart. You see, my mother wanted to make very well ensure that I did not become a man who devalued women. And therefore, she had certain expectations of me. And so the words that I said mattered to her as much as the attitude with which I expressed them because she understood that the attitude was an expression of the heart. And it was at that level that my mother wanted to address. The level of the heart. And the condition of the heart. Knowing that the heart gives shape to the attitude, and the attitude, well, that's what influences the behavior. And that's something that I believe that John the Baptist is trying to bring his audience to the awareness of in his ministry. You see, in chapter 3 of Luke, we're just getting a snapshot, a, a kind of a a condensed version of his life in ministry. But that's where we find ourselves as we come back in to this story and into this reading today. We find John the Baptist addressing his audience and he's speaking to those individuals who have come out into the Judean wilderness and he's beginning to give them instructions. And the first thing that he does is he offers an indictment against them. He says, you brood of vipers. A snake. You know, a venomous snake. We understand what he's saying about them. The kind of power and punch that their actions bring. So he, he brings this indictment against them. And then, then in a moment he uses another bit of figurative language. Talking about cutting down a tree that doesn't bear good fruit. And then throwing it into the fire. So he brings up. An indictment, he then offers a consequence, but what, what I want to bring our attention to today is what he says right there in the midst of those two where he does offer a word of encouragement in the eighth verse, where he says to those who would hear him, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. We've talked so far a little bit about repentance. And we said it's just a turning back. And I know that that's a simplification of a complex process. 
Because when we go through a process of repentance, what we are talking about is first being able to acknowledge our isolation or our separation from God. And then it's getting to the point where we actually want to respond to the grace that God is offering us that allows us to turn back into a right relationship with God and then begin that process of moving back towards it. And then it means fulfilling that relationship by staying in that place of obedience. So it is a complex process that we're talking about here. But what it, what it really boils down to, what we've said that we need to have full awareness of, is we're talking about not just something that occurs in the head, it's something that occurs within ourselves. It is a transformation. It is a change of our heart. You know, that term, change of heart, it's a colloquial saying that we use, right? And we use it to mean uh, the process of arriving at a new attitude or a new perspective. So repentance, or that turning back to God, in our understanding, what we're saying, when we turn back to God, we have the expectation that it's going to present to us a new view, a new attitude where we once were facing this way, by the grace of God, we've turned inward and we have now are facing a new direction. This is the process of repentance. It's not a calculated decision. It's not something that we've measured out and, and thought about. It's something that is happening that's pulling us. It's working inside of us. Because when we make a calculated decision, what we arrive at is a belief or an opinion. And there's a big difference in believing and being. There's a big difference in believing in faith and being a person of faith. There's a big difference in believing in God and being a child of God. An obedient child of God. There's a difference between belief and being. I've been um, watching a show, I actually finished it not long ago, called Dope Sick. Has any of y'all seen this docuseries? It's disturbing. I'll I'll just go ahead and put that out there. But um, it's fascinating. It's based off a book by the same name. And... It just chronicles the rise of the opioid epidemic in America. And the reason I want to bring that to you, one of the things that I found very interesting as I was watching this docuseries was about what it took for a person who suffered from an addiction, what it took to get them to want to make a change. You see, these individuals, the ones that really hit rock bottom and wanted to experience something you know, new, they weren't making a decision in their head of saying, you know, I really need to do this to increase my chances of survival. Those who really were seeking sobriety were the ones who reached that point inside where they said what they really were in hope of, what they were really after was the promise of deliverance, the hope of deliverance from their addiction. And I started to think about how that is so true of all of us in our own lives. There's a big difference in believing and being. And repentance, repentance is that process of being able to to get to where it's not a calculated decision where we add it all up and say, ah, that provides for me the best Option for me to survive. Repentance is an emotional response to what we believe God is capable of doing within us. Repentance is that inner working of God's love in the core of who we are that is turning us away with the promise, but beyond the promise, the knowledge of hope of being rescued and restored to right relationship.
And this is what John was teaching to those who would listen to him. Knowing full well that those who would repent would not simply hold a belief, but that it would transform the way they saw things. And as their heart took on new shape, so would their attitude. And as their attitude was formed and molded, it would be conveyed and revealed through their actions and their habits, their thoughts, their words, and their deeds. And so he says, bear fruit worthy of repentance. I'm curious, what do your habits convey? What do my habits convey? What does my behavior reveal about me, my faith, my heart? And what about for you? Guess what I'm asking is, are we who we claim to be? Do we have a belief or have we become something? You know, on that day that John uh, was teaching these crowds, there were a number of people who came up to him. They were curious what they needed to do. And so they brought questions to him. What should we do, John? What about us? So to the first group, he looks to them. These are the plentiful. He says, if you have plenty, whether that be clothes or food, if you have plenty, share out of your abundance. Then the tax collectors came along. What about us, John? He says, well, don't collect more money than you're supposed to take. Pretty simple. Then some soldiers come along and say, and us? What what do you say to us, John? He says, don't use your strength or the threat of your strength to take advantage of other people. You know, each of these responses that John, uh, you know, shares with those who have come before him is striking to me because they all hint to the same thing. It's about seeking an accumulation of more than is needed. And in each case, the accumulation of more requires that others have less. Whether you withhold goods from people, whether you cheat or steal to get it from people, or whether you take it by force or by threat. I think what John is just trying to show to those who would hear him is that the repentant cannot serve God when they're focused on serving themselves. Friday night, we get to come here together. And we get to sing carols of praise because God loved us so much that he took on flesh in the form of an infant child. Simply so that God's love could be made known to all of us. And the simple question that we're asked is whether or not we're willing to receive this gift that will be given to us. And if we're willing, are we doing all things that we can to make ourselves ready so that we are prepared to receive into our hands the fullness of God's love in an infant child. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to stand and join me now as we affirm our faith through the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in 
through Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was I go forth in the, the fullness of confidence that you are loved by God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, go forth to make known that love to others. Amen. Thank you.